soon as we started talking about traveling around the world with a kayak that's also a suitcase, we knew we'd end up in Venice. The kayaks would give us access to a side of the city that most tourists never see. We came in with just one rule, no Lonely Planet guides or must-see itineraries. We'd just explore. Every stop would either be a happy accident or a recommendation from a local. Actually, there was another rule. We had to kayak straight from the airport across the lagoon and into the city. That part of the plan was just a little bit crazy, which made it irresistible to David. found the perfect spot to stay, an old gondola boatyard turned bed and breakfast. But it was booked, so the owner recommended we stay with his friends Giovanni and Christina. Their apartment was right in the heart of the city, on a side canal so narrow we couldn't turn the kayaks around in it. They were so tickled when we showed up in kayaks that they asked us to stay for dinner. Giovanni prepared a perfect risotto, served with a primer on Venetian language and traffic patterns. If turning left, he said, you shout out, oi, prestando. If you go right, you say stagando. The next day, we paddle all over the city, hollering stagando, prestando, like a couple of kooks. Real Venetian watermen are a more stoic lot. If they need to tell you which way they're going, they'll point with a cigarette in their lips. Wander through the city's six neighborhoods, hip Conoreggio, hard-working Dorsoduro, touristy San Marco with its forest of selfie sticks. It's wonderful to get lost in a place with so much to see. We stop for dinner, then paddle into the wee hours of morning. Empty of traffic, the canals are as smooth as black marble. Next morning, we pack up the boats and take a ferry to Torcello a quiet island about eight miles north. It's impossible to separate Venice from the lagoon that has sustained and defended it for more than a thousand years. It's also the source of Venice's distinctive cuisine, and we decide to enjoy a long, slow meal here where the seafood is fresh and the prices are lower than they would be in the city. We start with prosciutto and melon, then seafood pasta and finally frito misto, a mixed plate of exquisitely cooked fish and other critters from the lagoon. We haven't eaten so well in years. We paddle past the 7th century Cathedral of Santa Maria Assunta and the guest house where Ernest Hemingway wrote his only bad novel. It's already evening when we paddle across to Burano, a fishing village famous for its pastel-colored houses. The light is perfect and David, the photographer, slips into a state of manic creativity for the next couple of hours. We start back at sunset, crossing miles of shallow grass flats on the cresting tide and enter the city by dark of night. Somewhere we miss a turn and spend the next hour paddling in circles and squares and polygons. The next day is our last and we decide to take it easy. Just a picnic and some quality hammock time. We know just the spot, B&B Alosquero, the old gondola boatyard turned bed and breakfast. Christina guides us through the market, the fruit stand that only sells locally grown produce, the best bakery and cheese shop, we just ask the shopkeepers what's best and buy it. We come away with three amazing cheeses, meats, fresh melon, and cherries. Our last stop is the wine store, where they fill our plastic bottle with a liter of pretty good red for three euros. The thing about not planning too much is that sometimes you don't plan enough. I booked an early morning flight, which meant we had to start paddling at 3.45 the next morning just to get to the airport. So we sat back in the hammocks, drank the rest of the wine, and laughed. As David put it, you can't watch the sunrise on the water from a bus. Oh. 